4.0, approximately. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. And the second reading is from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, 1 to 10. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 to 10. It's two chapters back. <coughs> Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable not in passionate lust like the heathen, who do not know God, and that in this manner no one should wrong his brother and t or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all those such sins, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other, and in fact you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. It ends the reading. Pauls, and uh, it's good to have you with us. Friends, um, we've been working our way through a series on relationships, um, and this this morning we're going to be coming to, uh, to something that's entitled Kissing, Dating, Goodbye. There is a question mark, okay, because I'm not kissing, dating, goodbye, but maybe we need to redefine and rethink the concept of dating. But before we do so and before we pray, uh, let me just um, say a couple of things. Firstly, to say that in your bulletin there's a pudding church, which is next week, next Sunday night. It's in the evening. It would be wonderful if you could join the students. They'd love to have you. And, and if you're able to bring something, talk to Amy. Don't phone her because the phone number is wrong in the bulletin. Talk to Amy. Or if you don't know who Amy is, uh, ask someone. Or otherwise speak to Karina at the office. Um, then just secondly, um, we've got... Uh, you may have got an invite as you came in. If you didn't, please grab one from the entrance table on the way out. Uh, it's uh, a week of meetings which we call in big questions, concise answers. Um, it's coming up from next Next week, that's right, it was 10th, yes, next week, uh, the 19th, Tuesday night, the Thursday night, and the Sunday night, as well as on the Sunday morning, we're going to be dealing with big questions that people ask. And I urge you and encourage you to take one of these, to read through the questions, and I'm sure you may well benefit to come along, but also to urge you and encourage you to invite others you think would benefit from, from, uh, from hearing short, quick answers, pithy answers, concise answers to those questions, They'll also be following that an open time for questions. So it's a great opportunity to come along and to bring guests. And then just to highlight with respect to this uh, series on relationships, uh, there's been a change to next week. I was due to do the fourth in the series on divorce, but David Seckham, the former principal of George Whitfield College, uh, is around at the moment, and we found that out, and we've taken the opportunity to invite him to preach. And we want to get him before he leaves. And so next week will be it. And he's writing a book on families, so that fits in perfectly with our series. So he's going to be speaking on families next week. Do keep that in mind. Friends, it would be helpful uh, if uh, this morning you kept your bulletins open. There's an outline there. Keep your Bibles open. We're going to jump around a fair bit, but we're going to stick very much in 1 Thessalonians uh, largely to begin with. 1 Thessalonians largely to begin with. Um, but the outline, it's, uh, it's, it's a busy outline this morning, which is never a good thing. But I'm hoping to get through a fair bit, and, uh, and hopefully the outline will uh, keep you, uh, help you to know where I am and where we are as we go along. Let's, uh, let's pray and ask God for his help. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you that we stand forgiven at the cross. What a love, what a cost. 
And Lord, we bring these gifts of money. and Indeed, we bring much more than that. We bring our very selves. And we want to put ourselves in your hands. And we want to ask that you'd use us and this money to further your kingdom. That others would come to hear and to heed the good news. We pray that as we consider your word this morning and as we consider the subject, we pray that you would give us by your spirit wisdom and understanding and strength to live as you please. For Jesus' sake. Amen. God is for singleness. Singleness is a gift, a good gift from God to be enjoyed and used in his service. How do you know if you have the gift? Well, if you're single, you've got the gift. God is for singleness, and we should affirm and honor and serve those who are single. Now, being single can be a legitimate choice. The Apostle Paul wishes others were like him. He says in 1 Corinthians 7, it's good to stay unmarried, single, as I do. And he goes on to explain that singleness is a gospel choice, a great choice. We must honor those who've made that choice. Though for many, being single may not be a choice. They'd like to exchange the gift of singleness for the gift of marriage. Note, the gift of singleness is still a gift, and so is the gift of marriage. But some would like to exchange that gift for marriage, and that's good too. God is for marriage. He's a fan. It's his idea. And God is for dating, which is just a cultural means to find a suitable spouse. And like everything, there's biblical precepts and principles which should govern govern and order singleness, marriage, and dating. Now, I guess that what we're going to be saying this morning will, I trust, be helpful to those who are single, but much more than that, helpful to all of us, actually, and particularly also helpful to parents and others who may uh, influence and help those who are in this situation. If we're going to talk, if we're going to talk about dating and how to conduct ourselves before marriage, well, we need to talk about marriage itself, because that's where you're heading or hoping to. So, marriage is designed by God to be a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman, which also produces and nurtures children. I'm just doing a brief recap of two weeks ago and last week. And if you haven't listened to them, please do on the website because this talk really builds upon them. And so marriage, lifelong commitment between a man and a woman, which also produces children. But it's not just a covenant promise or the context for procreation. Marriage is most importantly a picture. At a wedding, there's always lots of pictures, snapshots, photos of the bride, dress, hair, Uh, Groom, church, reception, flowers, guests, you name it. Well, marriage is a picture, a snapshot of a much greater and more important reality. That is the marriage between God and his people, the marriage between Jesus Christ and his bride, his followers, his church. Human marriage is a temporary earthly arrangement. It's a picture of the faithful, eternal, heavenly relationship of God with his people. And so as such, human marriage must reflect or testify to the marriage between God and his people. And so as such, it needs to be faithful and loving, marked out by service one to another. Faithfulness is the basis of marriage. Service is the purpose. Which is why sex is for marriage. Because it's meant to be enjoyed within a faithful relationship an exclusive commitment between two people. And it's meant to be an expression of service. Sex is not to be selfish. It's about serving another, ensuring their enjoyment and pleasure. So God says, before marriage, no sex. After marriage, lots of sex. Marriage is the destiny. Whatever you do before then has to keep that in mind. As Christians... We live now on earth in the light of what's ahead, our heavenly future. Well, we also live before marriage in the light of what's ahead, marriage. 
Recently, a friend of mine offered me some advice on time management. I need the advice. He said, whenever we say yes to something, we're saying no to something else. As Christians, we've also got to say yes and no, or no and yes. It mustn't be a ya near. It must be a ya and a near. Well, if you visit a lake or a dam, you might see a signboard saying, no fishing. And when you're driving, you may see a signboard saying, no U-turn. Well, the church ought to also have a signboard outside which says, no sexual immorality. It's not allowed. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, Paul says, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Sexual immorality is out of place among God's people. There shouldn't even be a hint. In Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, as Steve read for us, chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says, It's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Now, flip over with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and let's dig a little deeper into what God says there. The church in Thessalonica was doing really well. This is a letter full of commendation. They're doing good things. But look what it says in chapter 4, verse 1. We've looked at the no. Now let's look at the yes. Verse 1 says, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. What a compliment. And again in verse 9, just dropping your eyes down there, He says, now about brotherly love, we don't need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. I mean, that's that's two thumbs up, isn't it? Two great compliments. And yet, what else does Paul tell them? We'll look back to verse 1. He says, live in order to please God as you are living. Now, verse 2. We ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. And then look at verse 10. You love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Paul says, you're doing great, but there's more to be done. You're going well, but keep going. And in between verses 1 and 2 and verses 9 and 10, Paul highlights an area which might trip them up. He talks about sex. And if sex is an issue for this God-pleasing, people-loving church in Thessalonica, then I reckon it's going to be an issue for any church, any Christian. So what's Paul say? Verse 3. And here's what God wants for his people. He says, verse 3, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Now, sanctified simply means holy or set apart, different from the worldly culture around us. God wants us to be more and more sanctified. Therefore, verse 3, we should avoid sexual immorality. And here's how, verse 4. It's all got to do with control, self-control. Verse 4. Each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Control your body in a holy, set-apart, different-from-the-world way, which is what verse 5 says. Control your own body in a way that's holy, verse 5, not in passionate lust like the heathen who don't know God. It's a contrast, isn't it? A radical contrast. Christians should stand out from the world. They should look very different. This world is so relationship for skrik. The myth-making machine of Hollywood peddles lies about love, sex, and relationships. We are bombarded with impure images and immoral words from every side by movies, magazines, music. A world which 
sells sex and sexuality very cheaply. Money and sex make the world go round. The world says, here's the contrast, we are to be so different. The world says, be stingy with your money and generous with your body. Jesus says, be generous with your money and stingy with your body. And yet the world controls so much of our thinking and behavior. We so easily go with the flow and we just absorb the world's values and standards. So make no mistake, controlling your body is going to be counterculture. It's it's against the very grain of this world. If you drive to a neighboring state, you'll have to go through border control. And unless you've got a visa or a passport, you won't be let through. Without a license, it's a no-go zone. Well, as with border control, we should have body control. Unless someone has a passport, a marriage license, your marriage license, our bodies are no-go zones. As God's holy people, we must control our bodies in a holy, honorable way in marked contrast with this world. Not sure if you've seen the DVD, but Pam Stencil, uh, well-known sex educationalist among high school children in the USA, in her DVD entitled Sex Has a Price Tag, she's a Christian lady, talks about girls who end up pregnant. When asked how they ended up having sex, she says that they say, it just happened. And she says, and I quote, Really? So you were walking down the road naked and you just happened to bump into your boyfriend and the sex just happened? Nonsense, she says. It started way down the track when you fired each other up with passion. It happened because you did not learn to control your bodies. Which brings me to the how of body control. If we've got to control our bodies, how do we do that? Well, controlling your body is a mind thing. Josh McDowell, also a well-known youth speaker in the USA, says that your most important sexual part of your body is your brain. Your brain, your mind, is the control center of your body. Sexual immorality and sexual purity starts up here. So, guys, young men, stop thinking with your hormones, think with your head. And young ladies, don't think with your heart, think with your head. Hormones, mushy emotions, they're good things. But you mustn't think with them, think with this. So, men and women, don't entertain those thoughts. It's not wrong to be tempted, but it's wrong to play around with that temptation in your head or heart. And it's wrong to put yourself in the way of temptation. We must control our bodies, and the key is our minds. We must be self-controlled, which is a word that pops up all the way through chapter 2 of Titus. Paul's given instructions to the people in the church, old men, young, uh, old men, old women, young men, young women, And the thread running all the way through the chapter 2, instructions to those people, is the word self-control. In fact, when it comes to young men, there's only one command they're given. The other other groups get all these other commands, lots and lists, but young men only get one command. Is that because they're so godly? I think not. It's because young men need only that command because that command, self-control, kind of covers everything, doesn't it? If your mind is your most important sexual part of your body and it controls your body, then you've got to be careful what you fill that mind with. You've got to watch what you fill your mind with. Don't fill it with junk. Watch what you watch. Watch what you read. Control what you look at. It's eye control. There are surveys that say an astonishing number of Christian men are looking at pornography regularly. They're allowing themselves to be aroused by women that are not their wives. 
that they are engaging in a sexual relationship of sorts with someone they should not. While pornography is a very serious problem, and we should discuss it a whole lot more, I want to look at something far more subtle and part of everyone's lives that has the same effect. Ordinary, everyday, TV, movies, magazines, newspapers, and books. How many of us would say that the movie Titanic is pretty harmless? It was rated PG-13, yet there is a scene, and trust those who watch it will remember it, where Leonardo DiCaprio, yes, some of you know what's coming, where Leonardo DiCaprio sketches a naked Kate Winslet. It's a sexually charged scene. We wouldn't sit around watching this if we happened to walk into the room in real life, would we? What's the difference just because it's a movie? What about the fashion catalogues that are slipped into the newspaper? They advertise children's wear on page one, shoes page two, sports clothes on page five, and lingerie on page seven. Lots of near naked women. How many men stop to dwell on these pages? They don't need ladies' underwear, so what are they pausing for? We take so much as okay when it's not. Try to show us that our culture, we so easily are absorbed into it when actually we need to be radical about controlling our bodies, our minds, and our eyes. Well, let's move on to our next point. Many Christians today presume physical intimacy and dating go hand in hand. So here we get into dating. Excuse the pun, uh, hand in hand, physical intimacy and dating. And they've developed a sort of Richter scale of what is and isn't allowed. Sex isn't allowed, but passion and kissing is okay, while pettiness for couples who really like each other, and if you're engaged, you can almost go all the way. So what they do is that somewhere between kissing and sex, we try to draw a line. But drawing a line is not Christian. It's pharisaical. Most people who ask, how far can I go, are not looking for a limit, but an excuse. They're really asking, what can I get away with? How far can I go is the wrong question to ask. You should ask, How can I stay pure, and how can I keep this other person pure? And to that question, the Bible gives a very clear answer. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5, if you've got it. Steve read it, but it would be good if you could see it with your own eyes. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. Paul again is giving commands to Timothy on how to behave towards different groups of people in the church. And he says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters, with absolute purity. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Treat younger women as sisters with purity, absolute purity. You may ask, how far can I go? The answer is, treat your special other person as your sister. Join the dots. You don't need to be a rocket scientist. Now, does this mean affection of any kind is out? Well, let me ask. Is it appropriate to show affection towards your sister? Yes, of course. I order my boys to give their sister hugs and kisses. Hugs and kisses are appropriate ways to show affection to family members and friends. But there are hugs, and then there are hugs. There are kisses, and then there are kisses. There are acts of affection, and then there are acts of arousal. Acts of affection are acts of love. Acts of arousal outside of marriage are not acts of love. 
If you want to know what's what, ask yourself, would I treat my sister in this way? Or ask yourself, am I treating this woman with absolute purity? Now, I know our society thinks very differently, doesn't it? What the Bible is saying here is radical, and it's laughed off by others as crazy. In fact, it's laughed off as crazy by many Christians. What we're told by the world is that you've got to be compatible. There's got to be physical chemistry, which means you need to try before you buy. That's rubbish. The Bible has a compatibility test as well. If you want to know if you're made for each other, physically speaking, the key is, if you're a man and she's a woman, you're compatible. You've passed the test. Well, let's come to my fifth point this morning on your outline. Dating. That is, asking to spend time with someone is, as I've said before, a cultural means of finding a partner. Nothing wrong with that. It's good. There's many ways and many different cultural ways to find a partner. And dating is a very popular one uh, today. But dating, as it's understood by the world, does need to be redefined, doesn't it? In the light of God's word. It needs to be reworded or rather understood from a biblical perspective. Or otherwise we could perhaps reclaim the concept of what some people call courtship. Courtship is best defined as an exclusive friendship with a view to marriage. A friendship towards marriage. Courtship is intentional. It's working and heading towards marriage. It may not get there, but that's the mindset. Because courtship keeps your future spouse in mind now and keeps her future spouse in mind now. Keep yourself pure, keep her pure. So ask, will her future husband, even if it's not you, will her future husband thank you for keeping her pure? Or, on the other hand, simply behave in such a way as if her father is present at all times. There's lots of good wisdom when it comes to dating this way. And let me add a few words of general wisdom. They aren't right, these aren't right and wrongs. They're just good godly sense. Uh, make friends. Nice and slow. Have fun. Talk. Communicate. Show affection, but don't arouse. Uh, be careful where you spend time together. Cars are made for transport, not for late night chats. I say to students, I also say to them, beds are made for sleeping in, not for sitting on. So don't care in your kamer care in public. Furthermore, spend lots of uh, family and friends time. Spend good time with his or her family. Spend time with his or her friends. It's healthy and helpful. And you know what? You'll get to know them a whole lot quicker, seeing them in those contexts. Furthermore, be careful when you spend time together. Don't have late, late nights. And then here and most probably heed the advice of your Christian parents or elders. Value their advice. Don't listen to the sitcoms who make parents out to be idiots. Your parents aren't. They actually know you very, very well, and they know much better than you what marriage is all about. So value, hear, and very likely heed the advice of Christian parents or elders. And then here's some questions to ask. Three questions to ask when considering if you want to marry someone. First question, can I? Can I marry this person? This is a question of obedience. It's a matter of righteousness, a matter of right and wrong. The Bible gives some very clear guidelines here on, on this question. Can I marry a person? Well, uh, four clear things the Bible says. You must marry a human person. No bestiality. Secondly, you must marry someone of the opposite sex. There's no homosexual practice allowed. Thirdly, they must be single. No adultery or fornication allowed. And fourthly, if you're a Christian, 
they must be Christian. So there it is, human, opposite sex, single and Christian. If they qualify on those grounds, you're obeying God. You've made the right choice. If they don't qualify, it's the wrong choice. Which actually means that there's a lot of right choices, isn't there? We can be overly fussy looking for the one, which I'll come to at the end. Second question. Should I marry this person? That's a question of wisdom, not obedience, of wisdom, a matter of good judgment. It's possible to make a right choice, but not a wise choice. So take care to look for the good and not the good looking. Look for Mr. or Miss Righteousness, godly character that will grow and get better. As Proverbs 31.30 declares, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Who fears the Lord? Charm, beauty, well, it's fleeting, it'll go. This is a matter of time, but those who fear the Lord, well, let's praise them. Based on Ephesians, Colossians, and 1 Peter, on three passages there, women should look for a gentle, considerate, for a gentle, considerate, loving man worthy of respect. Watch out for the selfish man who's looking to be served, not to serve. On the other hand, based on those passages, men should look for a loving, respectful woman who fears the Lord and whose beauty comes from her inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and submissive spirit, as 1 Peter outlines. Men, watch out for the quarrelsome or ill-tempered woman. Proverbs has plenty of warnings there. So, can I? Should I? And then third question, do I? Do I want to marry this person? That's a question of personal preference or subjective choice. It's trivia. The color of the eyes, the breadth of their shoulders. Can I? Should I? Do I? Those are the three questions to ask. Now, I might say that Hollywood blows up the third question to be really big and important. And the other two to be really small and unimportant. In God's book, the first one is huge. It's a question of obedience. Can I marry this person? The next question is important to God. It's a question of wisdom. So apply your mind. Make good judgment. The third question is of little importance to him. It's not unimportant, but it's of little importance. Let's put it in its rightful place. And so, as I mentioned, let's finally speak about the one. How will you know that this is the one God wants you to marry. When and only when you say to each other, I will on your marriage day, at that moment you know that this is the one God intended for you and not before. I know I've said a lot and there's probably lots to discuss and debate and think about. But in this church, we are committed to God's word. We're committed to the Bible being authority over us and to order and govern our lives in every area and aspect of our lives. And I think this is one area of our lives, as we've looked at two weeks ago and last week as well, and this week, is an area in our lives which is sadly too often just going with the flow of the culture around us and the world around us. So I encourage you to think through further what has been said and to check it out with God's word. Let me briefly close by reminding us of God's love for us. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, in that wonderful passage on marriage, he says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy to cleanse her by washing with water through the word and present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Friends, those of us who sit here who know the Lord Jesus know that Jesus Christ went to great lengths at great cost to make us his own, his bride, a radiant, beautiful, without stain, wrinkle or blemish, a holy bride, forgiven, cleansed. 
as God's people, the bride of Christ, we're set apart to be holy, different from the world, radically different, counter-cultural, especially when it comes to relationships, all our relationships. God wants us to treat each other with love. As Christ loved his bride, so we ought to love one another. And we must treat those of the opposite sex with purity, absolute purity. Amen.